Okay, guys. Um, if you don't mind, you can listen up for a second. Um, so I know, and I figured that this would happen, that there's probably a lot of uh, questions and issues about the OWL system right now. Um, I actually don't have any office hours today, but um, uh, Inez, or Inez will, uh, is going to be, hopefully, be able to be tutoring tomorrow. tomorrow. Um, and that is going to be in HSD 121C. Is that where that's going to be? Uh, no, she wants us all in the, um, the main tutoring center over there in continuing education. Okay, so it's going to be continuing education? Yeah, on Saturdays only. The rest of the time I'll be down here. Okay. So the continuing education center? Is, that, is there a room number, do you know? 100. 100? And you're going to be there for three hours, you think? Okay. Um, from 10 to 1, so 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that's will be tutoring. Okay, so if you're having trouble with the owl, like doing some stuff, uh, I know that it's kind of finicky putting the right things in. If you guys haven't started yet, I would definitely recommend you start tonight because more than likely you will have a little bit of issues. Um, it shouldn't be taking you 10 hours uh, to do the initial assignment. But it should only be taking you a couple of hours for each assignment, maybe up to five or six but uh, for the week. But um, not too much more than that. Yeah, I think, I think, I think what it's going to come down to is you guys are going to learn the symbols, learn the <coughs> executions, and then once you do that, it'll, you know, start rolling quite along. Okay, so. Are you talking about that? Ow. Yep. So that's the required homework, everybody. That's the required homework. It's the owl stuff. So where I say recommended homework assignments, that's just recommended, okay? That's just supplemental for your own stuff. And then, of course, I have extra homework assignments that, um, or extra homework sets that I have all the answers written out to. And, of course, also on top of that, I have videos where I show you how, in detail how to do certain problems, okay? And that's what my office hours are like. My office hours are always in here uh, doing those types of problems. I'm assuming, since I've had four office hours and I've had nobody come to office hours, that nobody's having trouble with the class, okay? That's the only assumption I can make, okay? Once you guys start coming and telling me, oh, I'm not understanding how to do this problem, I'm not understanding how to do that, then I'll have um, more of an idea. But right now, I think that everybody's doing well, okay? So if you don't come to me and tell me, I have no other way of knowing, okay? Uh, again, uh, I'm going to be using Blackboard. Uh, I put all of your assignment due dates, I put the exam dates, I put the quiz dates, everything up on the calendar in Blackboard, okay? So there's a calendar function. Is, there, is anybody not familiar with the calendar function in Blackboard? Okay, so everything's set in that calendar function now, so you guys can look at it. I've also um, put a printout of the calendars on my office door, okay? So if you're not familiar or you don't have a computer with you or something like that, you want to go check, you can just run to my office door and look, okay? So the whole schedules, or at least the schedule for August and September is up there right now because my door isn't big enough for the whole of the schedule. So hopefully everybody has read chapter one by now. If you haven't, then I would suggest you do that. And I think we got to about right here, right? Okay, so um, if there's no questions before we start, anybody got any questions or comments or anything? Okay, cool. I'll be here for a few minutes after class, too, so if you guys want to come up and talk to me, um, tell me whatever. Uh, that would be an appropriate time. Okay, so let's get started today. Uh, there's an attendance sheet passing around. Make sure you uh, sign that attendance sheet. 
Okay, so we were talking about um, pure substances and molecules. Um, the, the very last thing we talked about were the differences between pure substances and molecules. So if I have a bottle of water, pure water, like distilled water, okay, that would be a pure substance, okay? Many of the same type of molecule within a volume of substance, okay? No mixture of different types of molecules, if you will. Okay? So, the pure substance, we're talking about the bulk of the solution. Okay? We're talking about the bulk of the material. We're not talking about the individual particles that compromise that bulk. Okay? Those individual particles are known as molecules. So, those are the smallest portions of the pure substance. Okay? So, any little particle... Um, that's a combination of atoms we call a molecule. Okay? So, here we see oxygen. I don't know if you guys can make that out, but it's two little red balls stuck together. Okay? And we call that O2. So that's a molecule. Okay? That's a molecule. Uh, the next substance we have here is carbon monoxide. Its chemical formula is well, there's a red ball stuck to a black ball. C is the black ball. O is the red ball. Okay? This is also a molecule. Okay? And then we'll look at the other one, carbon dioxide. Two, black, uh, two red balls stuck to a black ball. CO2. Okay? This is also a molecule. Okay. <clears throat> now we can say, well, there's a difference between this, this, uh, this one and these two, right? This one's composed of two of the same types of atoms, okay? Right? Two oxygen atoms, no other types of atoms. The only classification we can say with this, this is a molecule. Okay? Here, notice, we've got two different atoms in combination with each other. We said it's a molecule, yes, and it is, because it's the smallest particle of a pure substance, but we also call this a compound, okay, because it's composed of at least two different atoms. So not only is this a molecule, it's a compound, okay? And what do you think about this, guys? Do you think this is going to be a compound as well? Yeah. Why is that? It's got at least two different types of atoms, okay, so it's going to be called a compound. So it's both a molecule and a compound. All of these are particles as well, okay? Individual particles. Helium, for example, helium doesn't bond with anything, okay? So we can't really call it a molecule because it's not a combination of different atoms bonded together, okay? Or separate atoms bonded together. We'll just call this an atom or a particle, just like we could call all of these particles. Okay? So there's a difference between the types of substances you can find in nature. Okay, so let's talk about the atomic theory really quick. Um, so this guy's name is Dalton. He came up with the atomic theory. He was actually just kind of a high school chemistry teacher, ironically enough. But he was very uh, learned in uh, reading the current chemical literature of the time. So he took all of these papers that he was reading and realized that he could put them together and come up with a uh, entire theory of how um, atoms, compounds, and stuff worked, okay? So what he postulated was that all matter consists of atoms. And in fact, he came up with this <coughs> quite some time, time ago, a couple hundred years ago, and most of the postulates still hold true today, okay? So it was quite a groundbreaking um, piece of work, if you will. Okay, so all matter consists of atoms. Atoms of a particular element are identical in mass and other properties 
and are different from atoms of any other element. So what does that mean? So if I have a helium atom, and I compare it to another helium atom, okay, what does that mean? That means that those two atoms are exactly the same, okay? Um, they are identical in mass, so we can see the average mass is 4 AMUs for each of them. Uh, and they're identical in all other properties. They'll all make my voice very high if I suck them in, okay? Same kind of thing. But if I compare it to neon, okay, it's going to be different than that other atom, okay? Um, this postulate holds true almost all of the time. We'll go into little details about when it does not hold true, but for the most part it does. So for all of these things, for right now I want you to think, okay, they're all true. There's just little details that uh, might be a little different now. Okay, so something we've just talked about, compounds result from the chemical combination of a specific ratio of atoms of different elements. Okay, so what does that mean? So, the specific ratio of atoms. So that means we have to have atoms of different elements so, would O2 be considered a compound then? No, right? Why not? It's the same atom. Okay, so we can cross that guy out. Right? So what about here? CO and CO2, those are compounds because they're composed of two different types of atoms. And what does the rest of this mean? The combination of a specific ratio of atoms. Okay, so what that means is every compound or every particle of carbon monoxide you find is going to be composed of a one to one ratio of C to O. Okay, that's what that's saying. Okay, just like when we look at CO2, this is a different compound than carbon monoxide. Of course, um, you might know this. Uh, people get poisoned by carbon monoxide quite readily and then they keel over. Carbon dioxide won't poison you. Okay, so they're different. They have different chemical properties, different physical properties. Uh, this compound is always going to be a one to two ratio. Okay, so that's what that's talking about. Does everybody understand that? Okay. So uh, it's kind of convoluted terms, but it's really not um, <laughs> something that's very, you know, groundbreaking or what. Okay, so. Um, and again, different elements. Uh, so every molecule of a particular compound always contains the same number and same type of atoms as any other molecule of that compound. Again, if I grab one CO molecule with one hand and one CO molecule with the other hand, I look at them and I compare them, they will look and behave identically. That's what this is saying. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, cool. The last postulate is that atoms can be rearranged, separated, combined, but cannot be created, destroyed, or converted into atoms of any other element. There's a little bit um, of falsehood in this statement, but not very much. Okay, essentially, you can believe this wholeheartedly unless you're doing nuclear reactions. Okay, so if I was going to you know, look at what's happening in the sun or look at what happened when the bomb dropped on Hiro Hiroshima or something like that. That would be kind of uh, not going along with this postulate. But those are very, very specific situations, okay? For the most part, if you're not talking about nuclear reactions, this is always true, okay? And we know that, right? So atoms can be rearranged, uh, separated, combined, but cannot be created, destroyed, or converted into other atoms. So what you'll find is, I don't know, uh, C6H12O6 can go to um, 
I don't know, carbon dioxide plus water. Okay? Well, let's, let's not do that big one. Let's do just, because it's easier to balance this other equation for you guys especially. So H2O, we can take water and uh, through electrolysis, break it up into its constituent elements, right? So if we put a uh, charge through this, it'll break it up into hydrogen plus oxygen. Okay, what we want to make sure we do is when we do a chemical reaction, we have to balance that reaction uh, completely. Because if we don't do that, we're implying that we've either created or destroyed atoms, okay? So, here we've got two hydrogens, right? Here we've got two hydrogens, so that's okay. Here we've got two oxygens, but here we've only got one oxygen. Does everybody see that? So what we need to do is put a two in front of the water altogether, okay? We'll go into balancing equations ad nausea later, okay? I'm just doing this um, for your own benefit so you can see right now, okay? So you don't have to really focus on this super much, okay? So, but now we got four hydrogen atoms here, right? Does everybody see that? Two times two is four. So we've only got two on this side, so we've got to put a two in front of that H2, okay? So now we say, okay, we've got four hydrogens here, four hydrogens here, two oxygens here, and two oxygens here. So now we can say that matter has neither been created or destroyed through this chemical reaction. It's only been rearranged to, do, to make different types of molecules. Does everybody understand that? Okay, cool. So um, in order to uh, emphasize this rule, you're going to need to be able to balance all of your chemical equations, okay? And again, we'll be learning how to do that in subsequent chapters. Don't harp too much on it right now, because I know right now it might be a little um, difficult for you to do, okay? But we'll do it so much that you guys will be doing it in your sleep. I promise you that, okay? You'll be not wanting to do it in your sleep because you're doing it so much in your sleep. <laughs> I'm serious. Okay. So molecules can, of course, be um, uh, classified into two different types of molecules. Homoatomic molecules, those are molecules made up of only one type of atom. Or heteroatomic molecules, which are molecules made up of different types of atoms. So, what is another name for heteroatomic molecules? Compounds, yeah, very good. Everybody knows that, right? Everybody knows that. I know it's so early in the morning, but let's try it again. What's another name for heteroatomic molecules, guys? Compounds, Compounds right? Okay, cool, yeah. So everybody understands the difference between homoatomic molecules, which we can just call molecules, okay? Or heteroatomic molecules, which we can call compounds. Okay. Well, compounds or molecules that are made up of two atoms, we call diatomic molecules. Okay, di means two in Latin. Okay. Triatomic molecules, how many do you think those are made up of? Three. Three. Okay. What about poly? Poly is, means many. Made up of more than one. Yeah, made up of more than one. Good job, right? Yeah, made up of more than one because poly means many. Okay, so uh, there's different classifications of compounds, molecules, etc. So let's try this. Uh, what type of molecule would this be? Or what type of compound? This is a uh, diatomic, right? What about this one here? Triatomic. Does everybody see that? Those of you who aren't answering, you you understand? Okay, because this is very important stuff. It's all very important. I shouldn't have to say that every time. Promise. Okay. So there you can see some more examples of different. So this would be like a polyatomic, polyatomic, polyatomic type. Okay. So we've talked about matter a little bit now. Let's classify matter. Uh, bulk matter. 
not talking about the individual particles anymore. Let's look at the bulk of the matter now. Okay. So what we can see with our eyes, not just infer from what we know about chemical knowledge. Okay. So we're going to classify matter through a collection of subdivision that exists into which matter may be grouped. So matter, everything is matter. Remember, anything that has volume and has mass is matter. Okay, so that's everything. Um, so matter can actually be uh, separated into heterogeneous matter and homogeneous matter, or homogeneous matter. Some people like to say that. Um, homogeneous matter is also known as a pure substance. Okay? Heterogeneous matter would be like a mixture of substances. Okay? So, um, some, some types of heterogeneous matter would be like the coffee drink that I see right now. Or um, seawater. Okay? Salt water. Um, you can imagine a lot of them. Air is heterogeneous matter. Uh, a variety of things. Okay, Anything that's a pure substance is homogeneous matter. So you can imagine if you have heterogeneous matter, you can take the two pieces, two or more pieces, and physically separate them out to make each of them be a pure substance. So how would I do that? Say I had um, salt water. How could I... So that's heterogeneous matter, right? Salt water, does everybody agree with me that salt water is heterogeneous matter, right? It's got salt and water in it, right? How would I physically separate those two components? How could I do that? Could boil it, and what would that do? Evaporate the water and leave the salt, right? I could, I could collect that water, and then I would have the two substances physically separated. Does that make sense? So I took them from being heterogeneous matter to having two uh, bulk uh, pieces of homogeneous matter. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So, homogeneous matter and pure substances are s very, very similar, okay? Solutions, homogeneous matter, they're very, very closely related. We're gonna, we're just gonna think of it as pure substances, though, okay? And then pure substances can be separated into compounds and elements, okay? Pure substances can then be separated into compounds and elements. Of course, we've got elements here, compounds here. So, a pure substance is a substance that has only one component. A mixture is a combination of two or more pure substances in which each retains its own identity, not undergoing a chemical reaction. A pure substance can be either an element or a compound. An element is a pure substance that cannot be changed into simpler form of matter by any chemical reaction. Right? So you've got a copper atom, you can't change that into a gold atom. Okay? You can't change that into a hydrogen atom. You got a compound though, you could potentially change that into simpler substances by breaking it apart and taking it into its atoms. Okay? Okay. We could also have a mixture, a heterogeneous mixture, which would be non uniform composition, random placement. Okay, so that would be like if we had sand, and metal filings, okay? Those would be non-uniform mixtures. We could pick things out, okay? Pick them out. Uh, I don't have any mixtures really up here. I should have brought something. Uh, but you can imagine. A homogeneous mixture, on the other hand, would be like a solution, okay? Like a salt water solution where we can't pick the salt, salt out and the water out unless we physically separate them by doing some sort of physical separation means, like distillation or something like that. So every piece of that bulk solution will 
have the same concentrations of different molecules no matter how, how big of a piece you take out, okay? So like a heterogeneous mixture, let's see if I can come up with something really quick. Uh, here's a heterogeneous mixture. You guys see this? So it's all chalk, right? But there's different pieces, okay? So if I take out one, Bulk thing, right? Okay, I got two yellows, a pink, purple, and a blue, right? Do you think if I go ahead and take out another, do you think I'll get that exact same thing? No. Probably not, okay? This is a heterogeneous mixture. A homogeneous mixture would be if I took out something and it would be the exact same thing every time. Okay, does that make sense? Does that make sense, the difference? You guys want to pass this around? You guys understand this stuff? Okay. If you do, let me know. And again, like a homogeneous mixture would be like the salt water or the Coke that you're drinking. If if Coke wasn't a homogeneous mixture, right, it wouldn't sell very much because every drink you take would taste different. Right? Does that make sense? So Solutions, that's what we call those things, um, are always going to be homogeneous. Okay. And here's some more examples, of course. This is what? A homogeneous or heterogeneous? This thing here. Heterogeneous, right? Uh, what about, um, well, they're all really heterogeneous. What about these guys? So this one is a pure substance, right? It's only water. Notice here, this is a salt water solution. This is a homogeneous mixture, okay? Every drink I taste, take will taste just as salty as the last drink, okay? So what about here? What is this guy? Oh, it's only one molecule, one type of molecule. So it's a... You can call it a compound or a pure substance would be the better way of saying it right now, okay? Pure substance. Look here, we've got two different types of substances. So this is a mixture of stuff, right? This is a solution, actually. This is like vodka, actually, because this is ethanol and water, which are the components of vodka. Okay, so this would be like a shot of vodka or something like that. So would that be a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? Homogeneous mixture, right? If not, what? Uh, absolute wouldn't be selling much vodka, right? Because like the last drink might not have as much alcohol as the first drink, okay? So this is a mixture, a homogeneous mixture. What about this granite rock here? You see, and you can't really see, but there's like black streaks here, red streaks here, white streak there. Is this a mixture or a pure substance? <laughs> mixture. It's a mixture. It's a solid mixture. Um, is it a homogeneous mixture? No. No, -uh, because if I take this little piece off, I won't have any of this white streak in it, right? I might not even have any of that black stuff in it, okay? So every piece I take off is going to be different, just like I was grabbing out of the chalk box, okay? So, so we've got a pure substance, mixture, mixture. This is a compound. This is a homogeneous mixture, heterogeneous mixture. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. What about these guys? Is this a pure substance, a copper pipe? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like it, huh? What about sugar by itself? Uh, yeah, yeah. No. Sugar? Just sugar? You guys probably don't know. Sugar is just one type of molecule, okay? So let's just pretend sugar is one type of molecule. So what would it be? Pure substance, yeah, and a compound, right? Is this a compound here, copper? No. Nuh-uh. -uh. What is it? An element, or an, a series of atoms, you could say. An element might be even the best way to think about it. What about this soft drink over here, this Coke? Is that a mixture? Is that a mixture? 
Is it a heterogeneous mixture? Nuh uh. What type of mixture is it? Homogeneous. Yeah, you guys are rocking this one. That's awesome. What about this stuff? Oil and water. Is that a mixture? It is a mixture. It is a mixture. You can mix it up. You know, you can mix it up. But as it is now, right, is it a homogeneous or heterogeneous mixture? Heterogeneous. Okay. It is a mixture. I know if we. If we only were looking at this top part, then it wouldn't be a mixture. And if we were only looking at this bottom part, it wouldn't be a mixture. Okay? But since we're looking at the bulk of the thing, it is a mixture. Okay? And it's a heterogeneous mixture, obviously. Okay, so does everybody understand the classifications of matter? Or at least tenuously at this point? Okay? Go back and read and... I'm sure you'll understand it even in more detail, okay? So let's talk about different types of observations. So we can, so in order to deduce uh, principles that the world runs by, we need to, and we as humans, since we're very curious, we always do uh, make observations. You know, I could make a number of observations right now. I'm sure you guys are as well, right? Like, um, I don't know, the floor is hard, okay? My shoes are brown. Uh, I am tall. Or uh, my voice projects, something like that. All of those are observations, okay? Um, in fact, all of those observations that I just made are known as qualitative observations, okay? Because they don't give a certain number and unit with the observation that I'm making, okay? Just like here, I could say, this is red, or this tastes good. So, it's described in informal terms, if you will, okay? No... Um, measurements are taken. So we're going to compare that to quantitative observations. Quantitative observations are made when you uh, make an observation and process that observation with numbers. Okay? I could say, well, we've got 416 miles to go. Okay? That's a quantitative observation because we have both a number that I'm using and a unit. The number being 416, the unit being miles. I could also say, well, man, we've got a long way to go, right? That would be a qualitative <coughs> observation. It would be the same observation, just one of them I'm using informal terms, the other one I'm using very formal terms, okay? In chemistry class, we're going to be using both qualitative and quantitative observations. The, the point of any science is to learn more and more and more about the natural world. Okay? And with quantitative observations, we can actually start making assumptions and predictions about what's going to happen. We can take those observations and say, oh, well, if we have this other situation, I'll bet you I can predict what's going to happen because I have all these numbers backing me up, okay? So some other quantitative observations would be like, I don't know, mass, okay? I weigh 225 pounds, okay? That would be a number and a unit, okay? Time, it is almost time to go is that that's not a quantitative observation right that's a qualitative observation it's not almost time to go but um, if I said it's 9.38 a.m. right that would be a quantitative observation because the number would be 9.38 the unit would be a.m. or o'clock or whatever you like okay. does that make sense to everybody okay cool Okay, so some people may be from a different country and that might be great because hopefully if you are from a different country they use the metric system in that country and you won't have to worry about converting from English to metric to 
actually have some idea about what's going on. Those of you who have lived in America, the United States, your entire life are probably so familiar with English units that metric units are very, very foreign to you. Unfortunately for myself and those of you who are like that, uh, all science is based uh, in the metric system. So we're going to be using the metric system almost exclusively in this class. Okay? So, at the beginning of the class, we'll be learning to convert from English to metric through dimensional analysis, okay? And that will be the beginnings of what you'll find that the majority of the chemistry problems you will be doing will be similar to, okay? So, just mostly kind of these conversion factors, okay? Dimensional analysis is what it's called. The English system is not based on any sort of rhyme or reason, okay? Like they decided that an inch was like the length of the king's thumb or something like that, and then they just set it down like that. That's an inch. A foot was the length from his wrist to his forearm or to his elbow, okay? So that's a foot. So these are measurements that are based off of very strange things. Okay? <clears throat> the metric system, on the other hand, is <clears throat> uh, units that are based um, on powers of 10 relative to each other. <clears throat> so what you'll find is one meter will be a power of 10 away from any other converted unit, like one meter equals 100 centimeters. But if we look at feet to inches, one foot to 12 inches to 0.33 yards, right? So we got 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 there. So it's a much easier conversion system, okay? But, again, at the beginning, if you're very familiar with the English units, it might be a little bit strange to start converting into metric. But once you get the hang of it, it really does start going pretty quickly. Okay, and it really does help you guys out so much more. It's like, you know, math, right? Uh, the Romans, the Romans weren't very good at math, okay? They couldn't do very many good calculations. But the Arabic, Arabic people, Middle Eastern people, they were very good at math, okay? They could do uh, all these crazy calculations. And why is that? Well... Arabic numbers are the numbers that we use today. Okay, one, two, three, four, those symbols that you're very used to. Could you imagine trying to do higher math with Roman numerals? Has anybody ever seen Roman numerals? Do you know like Super Bowl 42 or something like that? Right? I don't even know, you know? Uh, what is that? XX211 or something? You know, I don't even know. V X, well, I don't know, right? You can imagine it would be very difficult to do calculus or something like that with those types of numbers, okay? So it really, you want to think about it that way. If you're not using the real, the best system to figure things out, it'll be very difficult for you guys to make progress uh, in understanding things. Just like the Romans had a really hard time understanding things mathematically because they had such a poor numbering system. Once they adopted the Arabic numbering system or the Phoenician numbering system, it really started working out a lot better for them, okay? And they started building stuff a lot easier. And that's what we're going to do here. So we're going to take our English system that has really no good basis of why these measurements are the way they are and convert our thinking to the metric system which gives us better basis of things. Okay, so basic units in the metric system are going to be quantities without any metric prefixes, okay? This would be like a gram, a meter, or a liter. Let's compare these to things with prefixes. A kilogram, okay? A kilogram, so gram to a kilogram. One gram... 
one kilogram. This prefix, kilo, means 1,000, okay? So all this is telling us is that we have 1,000 grams, okay? So these prefixes are multipliers of that basic unit, okay? So kilo is 1,000 times <coughs> that basic unit. Centi is 1 100th times that basic unit. Milli is 1 1,000th and so on and so forth. Do you guys see these arrows that I have here? Those are the um, uh, prefixes that I want you guys to memorize and be very, very familiar with, okay? Because, again, we're doing chemistry. We're doing chemistry which uh, deals with things on a very, very, very small scale. So we're not going to be caring about so much about these mega, uh, these very big numbers. Okay, we're going to be caring much, much, much more about very, very small numbers. Okay, so we need to know these pico, nano, micro, milli, centi. Kilo, I want you to know because it's so common. Okay? Um, and then you can see some common metric units, length, volume, mass, temperature, energy, and time. Let's talk about significant figures now. Significant figures are information bearing digits of a number. Okay, so we make a quantitative observation. We got to know which digits are significant. Okay, so the significant figures are only found by the measuring device that you use. Okay, it's always going to be the number of graduations. Okay, plus one uncertain, the number of certain figures plus one uncertain. So if we see this, this, can you guys see this ruler kind of thing here? I know it's a little small, but you see that our length is to right there, that red line. Okay? That red line is what we're measuring. Well, we see that it's somewhere in between what? Five and six there? Do you guys see that? So, what we, would we say, well, that red line is five centimeters long? Would we say that? No. no. Would we say it was six centimeters long? No. no, we wouldn't say that either. We'd probably say it's about five and a half, right? 5.5 or, in this example, I think they use 5.4. So what are we doing with that last digit? We're estimating it, right? We're estimating it because we don't know, we know it's in between there, but we can't really estimated to any more precision than that. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what we find is we know for certain that the first digit is correct. We know for certain it's five something, right? So that's the certain digit. And then, whenever we do a measurement, we're always going to have at just one more digit, and that's going to be the digit that we're kind of sure of, but uncertain of. Okay? So, when we're talking about significant figures, we're talking about all the certain digits plus one uncertain digit, okay? So here we see we've got this, these graduations that just go one, two, three, four, five, six. So we can only be certain of the first number, which is five. And then we have to estimate the other one, giving us two significant figures. Let's look at this ruler now, the same red line, but notice we have what more demarcations, more graduations in that ruler, okay? Because we've got more graduations, we can estimate that number to a more certain figure, okay? More significant digits, okay? So in this case, we can say for certain that we, well, now we know it goes 5.123. Oh, okay, so now we know for certain, five and three are certain digits. Now we've got to estimate that last digit, which now I think they say 5.36, okay? So that's a more precise number than the 5.4. Why is that? Because our measuring device had more graduations on it, okay? But here, how many certain digits do we have now? Two. Two. How many uncertain? One. One. So how many significant figures do we have? Three. Okay, does everybody get that? 
So the, for the first one, we had one certain, one uncertain, two significant. The second one, two certain, one uncertain, three significant. Okay, this happens with every measuring device, even if it's a digital readout, right? Like I go on the scale, or if I put this on the balance, right, and it says it weighs 0 0.234 grams, okay, it's telling us for certain 2 and 3 are certain digits. But this 4, I don't know, maybe you've seen this before when you put something on a balance, that last digit kind of fluctuates sometimes. Okay? That's because it's not really sure of what it is. Okay? So it happens with every measuring device you do or use. Okay? So in this case, how many significant figures would we have? Three. Three. How many certain digits would we have? Two. Two. And how many uncertain? One. One. Always. Okay? Always going to be one uncertain digit at the end. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, good. Um, before we go, let's just go through the zero rules for the significant digits. Um, so all non-zero digits are significant. Remember, this is a measurement. So here we've got three certains, one uncertain, but four significant. Okay? Here we also have four significant because there's four non-zero numbers. Okay? Captive zeros, those are zeros located in between non-zero digits. So as we have here in this number 60.052, captive zeros are significant. Okay? This, so this number has five significant digits, four certain digits, one uncertain digit. Trailing zeros are significant if they're after the decimal point. So if the zero is after the decimal point, then it's significant. Trailing zeros are insignificant if they're not, don't contain a decimal point in that number. Like here, this number, 100 without a decimal point, only has one digit, okay? This would be like, because if we were measuring something, and was like zero, two hundred, and zero, and our measurement was like this, okay? So we can only do that estimation to one hundred, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Look here, and the difference, here we've got that decimal point there. That makes those zeros significant, okay? So in that second number, we've got three significant digits, that first number we have one, and any zeros to the left of a non-zero number are insignificant, okay? So go over these zero rules. You can do these questions here on your own, okay? Uh, make sure you send in that quiz one by today, okay, by five o'clock if you haven't sent it to me. And Al intro, math, and survey are due next Monday, okay? The end of the day next Monday, so make sure you guys get all that done. If you're having trouble, uh, Inez is having uh, office hours or tutoring hours from 10 to 1 on Saturday, okay guys? Okay, here, let me stop the recording.